Good morning and a very warm welcome to you indeed to our Cranmer Group online service this first Sunday of Lent, the 21st of February. It's great to have you with us today. I'm the Reverend Tim Chambers if I haven't met you and it's my pleasure to be the vicar of our six churches and six uh, villages that form the Cranmer Group. I hope to be able to meet you in person at some point soon. Before we start our service this morning, let's take a moment of quiet before the Lord. The Lord be with you and also with you. We open our service with the collect for today from Common Worship. Heavenly Father, your son battled with the powers of darkness and grew closer to you in the desert. Help us to use these days to grow in wisdom and power, that we may witness to your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sarah Hadfield. Uh, welcome back, Sarah. It's great to have you back with us after your um, slight uh, mishap on your bike and one or two injuries but Sarah is sufficiently well recovered to be able to play for us this morning and she's particularly delighted to do so because she's playing as a resident of Hawksworth a hymn written by the sometime rector of Hawksworth uh, George Hunt Smitten who was rector of that parish between 1851 and 1858 the well-known Lenten hymn 40 days and 40 nights Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's great to have you back. Pam Lochner is now going to read to us from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2. Thank you, Pam. The first reading is taken from Nehemiah, chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. Artaxerxes sends Nehemiah to Jerusalem. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins? and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, 
If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave him the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sabalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Nehemiah inspects Jerusalem's walls. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what, what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the Jackal Well and Dung Gate examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Pam. Lord, I pray that your word will touch the hearts of each one of us this morning that this story of Nehemiah will grab our attention and will seize our imagination and that I'll be able to speak the words that you wish me to speak, that you wish me to share with your people here in this Cranmer group of parishes this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it may seem a bit strange to some of you this morning that we're not starting a sermon series today that we're not doing so in chapter one of the book of Nehemiah. We're already on chapter two. How did that happen? What did I miss? Well, we had an online service on Wednesday, on Ash Wednesday this last week, the start of Lent. To be honest, uh, I'd uh, rather plan to begin a sermon series very much along traditional Lenten lines from last Wednesday. But as I was already part way through preparing my sermon uh, on Tuesday, 
I sensed really strongly that God was saying to me that now wasn't the time to be traditional in this respect, but that this season is to be one in which we reflect differently as we seek more of God's presence in our lives, both individually and collectively as his church family in our benefice. And that, as I shared with you last Sunday, uh, as we're prayerfully seeking a new vision for the Cranmer Group, now is the right time for us to explore a book of the Old Testament, the book of Nehemiah. A book that begins in uh, seeking God's presence in a desert time, a Lenten time that has many echoes of our current lockdown, of loss, of grief. But a book that also speaks to us so powerfully of godly vision, of looking forward to new possibilities in prayer and in action, of what the Lord has in store for us. After this period of exile that we've been going through, uh, as we emerge God's people, seeking to build anew, seeking to witness to our communities in imaginative and creative, bold new ways, and to minister to them as they try to come to terms with all of the impacts that uh, the pandemic has wreaked upon us. So my first encouragement to you all this morning, if you weren't able to be on the Ash Wednesday service this last week, is to go to the Cranmer Group uh, YouTube page or to our podcast page. Uh, both are clearly signposted from the Benefice website and catch up with the sermon from last Wednesday there. I hope you enjoy it and you find it stimulating too. If that is you, and also for those of you who were able to listen then, but who might like a bit of a refresher now, here's a super quick scene setter for you for the book of Nehemiah. Israel had been defeated. Jerusalem and the temple had been destroyed and the people of God taken into slavery in Babylon. Fast forward then over a century. Some Israelites had been allowed to return, but their holy city was still in rubble. Nehemiah, a Jew who had stayed in exile, um, but risen uh, there to a position of great prominence uh, as royal cupbearer. Uh, Nehemiah was told of the plight of his own people and he wept for them and for the ruins of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah turned to God in prayer and in fasting, in humility and repentance to seek his purposes so that he, Nehemiah, could do God's will for his broken people. So we find ourselves this morning at the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 2. It's certainly not one of the shortest chapters in the Bible, nor is it lacking in exotic names. So a particularly big thank you to Pam this morning for having read it so well to us all. And at the very start of chapter 2, there's a really important piece of information for us, but one that we may very easily miss. Nehemiah takes wine and having tasted it uh, as the trusted royal cupbearer uh, to ensure it's not poisoned, of course, uh, he takes wine and gives it to King Artaxerxes. Nehemiah tells us that this takes place during Nishan. The month of Nishan in the Hebrew calendar occurs at the same time as our February or March. But at the start of chapter 1, Nehemiah tells us that he receives the news of the desolation of Jerusalem in the month of Kishlev. Kishlev occurs during our November to December. This means that Nehemiah has been weeping and fasting and mourning and praying for the people of Israel for at least three whole months. 
Nehemiah was in a position of responsibility in the city of Susa, which contemporary accounts tell us was a city of libraries and schools, gardens and parks, a place of great civilization for its time. He'd have led a very comfortable life by the standards of the day there. But once he'd received the reports from Jerusalem of what was going on with the Jewish nation in that ruined and despairing city, God put on Nehemiah's heart what was on his heart. What really mattered to Nehemiah was the well-being of God's people. The state of what, uh, from a New Testament perspective, we might call the kingdom of God. Despite his material comfort, Nehemiah was so discomforted by this news that it, this was the only way in which he could respond to such an extent that he wept and prayed and fasted for months on end. This is hugely challenging to us, isn't it? When's the last time any of us, certainly when's the last time that I prayed for more than one hour, let alone days or weeks or months, because God has placed a burden on my or your heart. For the disciple of Jesus, there's no greater priority than the kingdom of God, than praying for the kingdom of God. Lord, thy kingdom come on earth as in heaven. And yet we continually find ourselves distracted. Um, we value other things far too highly. We try other avenues first, rather than doing what Nehemiah does, turning to God. Prayer is Nehemiah's first response, not his last resort. We read in verses 1 and 2 that Artaxerxes notices that Nehemiah is sad. This would have been extremely risky uh, in the presence of the king since it implied that uh, not everything was perfect under his rule. And indeed, Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. But Nehemiah responds to the king's question in a way that uh, would have appealed to his sensibilities. For the Persians, reverence for ancestors was incredibly important. So by responding to Artaxerxes uh, that the state of the city of Jerusalem uh, brought dishonour on his ancestors, Nehemiah maximised the possibility of receiving a favourable response from the king. And this prayerful response from Nehemiah immediately opens a tiny crack in the door of opportunity. The king said to me, what is it you want? Or to put it differently, perhaps, what is your vision, Nehemiah? This is Nehemiah's moment, even in the second uh, this second, after all of uh, hundreds of thousands of seconds of prayer that had gone before, Nehemiah shoots up to God an arrow prayer, if you like, a prayer in the moment, direct, immediate. Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. As Nehemiah prays, he goes into action. He knows that if he's to make the difference to God's people, uh, for which he's been praying with all his heart, this is the moment. And he's clearly been doing his homework as well. Nehemiah says later, when he has arrived in Jerusalem, I hadn't told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. In his months of prayer, Nehemiah hasn't just been uh, praying in isolation, nor has he just rushed headlong into the task, relying on his own intelligence and his own efforts. He hasn't fallen, so to speak, into these two ditches on either side of the road that God has set out for him. Nehemiah knows that he has to have his answers thought out for whenever the moment comes when he has an opportunity to speak with the king about what God had placed on his heart. 
so he thinks it through beforehand. He knows what safe passages he requires to get to Jerusalem. He knows what material resources he will need for rebuilding and where they're to be found. And he knows what personnel he'll need to accompany him on his journey to Jerusalem to ensure his safe passage. So when the king does ask him, he knows exactly what to respond. Nehemiah demonstrates that we need to maintain a balance between faith in the sovereignty of God and a need for logical and common sense planning in a situation as well. What perhaps we might acknowledge as the capacity to be filled uh, at the same time, both with the Holy Spirit and with good common sense. But most importantly, it's not just a good idea, but a God idea, an action born out of prayer that comes on Nehemiah. Prayer and action are not an either or, but a both and. We, like Nehemiah, are called both to prayerful action and to active prayer. And we're called, like Nehemiah, to join in with what God is already up to, to have our hearts broken for what breaks God's heart, and to have vision birthed within us that dwells in the tension between what is and what could be in our communities. If we look more closely at Nehemiah's story, we see three ways in which prayerful action and active prayer interrelate. Firstly, prayer prompts the action. It's the mother of action. But the corollary of this is that if our actions are all without prayer, then we may have got them wrong. Secondly, prayer is what makes the action fruitful. Nehemiah says repeatedly in verses 8 and 18 of chapter 2, It is because the gracious hand of my God was upon me that the king has responded favourably to his requests and his prayer can be transformed into effective action as he finds himself in Jerusalem to start the fulfilment of his dream for God's people. So prayer initiates the action Prayer enables the action. And thirdly, prayer engages others to join in the action. When Nehemiah tells the people of Jerusalem of his vision, of God's favour upon him, and of Artaxerxes' support for his plans, they too wish to join the good work. Let us start rebuilding, they declare. Nehemiah's dream of the renewal of God's city and his people is underway. All of this, like so much of the story of Nehemiah, is great at showing us God's faithfulness and sovereignty at work, whilst also giving us some really good life lessons as well. But how does Nehemiah's story so far shed light upon our envisioning of the future for our Cranmer group of parishes. Firstly, forgive me, Lord, I'm afraid I can't claim to have spent the last three months in constant prayer and fasting and grieving over the way in which so many of the people of our communities have no knowledge of God's love or of what it is to be part of the beautiful family that is Christ's church here. But I do pray, and I continue to pray every day, that God will show us what is on his heart for the people of our communities, and as for Nehemiah, that he will give us an extraordinary and compelling dream for the future of his people in this place, and that we will co-labour with him to bring that to reality. I've invited each member of both our ministry team, which is a small and prayerful group from all of our villages, and also our Benefice Council, to ask God for what's on their hearts for our people. 
and we'll share these personal visions over the coming weeks as we seek intertwined with continuing prayer to determine the Lord's plans for our communities. For those of you listening who are part of these two groups, it's my prayer that you'll spend good time in the presence of God and that he'll place clear pictures in your minds of his dreams for us all. And for those of you who aren't on uh, either the ministry team or the Benefits Council, may I encourage you to do two things. First of all, please, can you pray? Uh, pray that those of us who are part of these two formal groups will truly seek God's heart. And also pray that in a good way, like Nehemiah as he stood before Artaxerxes, we will find ourselves afraid of what lies before us as a result of imagining our shared future in this way. Because if we don't have in our Christian lives something that demands of us spiritual courage, something that builds our faith as a constant reminder of our dependence on the love and the grace of God in Jesus Christ, then I'd humbly suggest to us all that our vision is too small and that therefore it's very unlikely to be God's vision for us either. And secondly, I encourage you all to join with us in seeking God's heart for our communities and for our Cranmer Group churches within them at our First Things intercessory prayer gathering on Zoom uh, on Sunday the 7th of March at 8pm. Details on the Benefits website. Do join us then and be part of our journey of prayer towards a shared future that continues to honour our past, but which also imagines a future for our communities and our churches alive with the presence of God, with the presence of the Holy Spirit amongst us, full of the ways of the kingdom and bringing all glory to the Lord. That is our prayer. Join us in that. In the words, once again, of the collect for today, with which we began our service. Heavenly Father, help us to use these days to grow in wisdom and prayer, that we may witness to your saving love. Amen to that in Jesus' mighty name. Jules Humpherson will now lead us in our intercessory prayers for today. Thank you so much, Jules. In the power of the Spirit, let us pray to God the Father that through his dear Son, he would accomplish his will for the Church, the world and all the people we pray for. As we enter this season of Lent, let us all take time to reflect on the way we live our lives and how that impacts others. Make us more mindful of how we should look after the world that we have neglected so badly, that we may leave it better than we found it. Let us also be mindful of all those who live in poverty, in fear, in loneliness throughout the world, that we may help them in their times of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our country we pray for the government, that they lead with integrity and honesty instead of the self-interest we experience so much of. In our benefits, may we take time to think about our vision process prayerfully, considering the future direction we should take to strengthen and grow our worshipping community. Let us take time to listen to others with open minds so that we can help create a loving and caring future together, a future that is full of the hope we need so much at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, that you may bring them comfort and care for their suffering. We pray for those who have died at this time, and ask that you bring solace and comfort to those who mourn them. May we also pray for the NHS staff, 
themselves suffering from the strain of coping with so many people sick and dying as a result of the pandemic. Give them strength and bring them hope that their trial is coming to an end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we rejoice in your spirit. Send it into our hearts, into our lives and into our world. Hear our prayers and save us in your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. And the collect for today, the first Sunday of Lent, from the Book of Common Prayer. O Lord, who for our sake didst fast forty days and forty nights. Give us grace to use such abstinence that our flesh being subdued to the Spirit, we may ever obey thy godly motions in righteousness and true holiness, to thy honour and glory, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Deb Hubbard is now going to lead us in our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Thank you so much, Deb. Do join in at home. The words will be on the screen as usual. Thank you so much, Deb. I'll bring our service to a close in a moment, but first a couple of notices. Thank you, first of all, for your amazing generosity over the course of the past few months with your donations to the Cranmer Food Hub that we've been running throughout our six villages. We've been able to support, through your generous donations, a number of individuals and families who have really struggled with hardship through these pandemic months. It's been a real blessing to be able to support them in this way. They do still need our continuing help 
So it will be wonderful if you can keep making your donations, leaving them in our churches as you have been doing over the course of the past weeks uh, and we'll be able to continue blessing those households throughout our communities. Thank you so much again for all your support with that. And secondly, it's our First Things Intercessory Prayer on Sunday, March the 7th. How do we get to March? I don't quite know, but anyway. Um, Sunday, March the 7th, 8 p.m. on Zoom. As I mentioned in my sermon, we'll particularly be praying for the vision of our parishes, our Cranmer Group vision that we're, uh, we're prayerfully discerning at the moment. So do please join us on Zoom at that time to be part of that prayerful discernment process. I look forward very much to seeing you all there. I'll bring our service to a close now with a blessing. Christ, give you the grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you and those you love always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Go well, be blessed. If you're watching on Sunday, do join us on Zoom at 10.45. We look forward to seeing you there for a catch-up. Stay safe, take great care and goodbye.